Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello everyone and welcome to the WITS KPPM Workshop 2021. I'm your host, Dr. Rabah Zaidi, Ambassador of Stanford's WITS at Bahrain and organizer of this event. I'm here today with members of our amazing team, Dr. Manar al Professor of Math at KPPM and one of our speakers, Dr. Iman Bidleo, Professor of Computer Science and our session chair, and with Bahrain, Co-Ambassador with Iman and Ishtuari. We're thrilled to have you with us today in the second WITS workshop that is organized in cooperation with the Female Education Division at KPPM, headed by Professor Suleiman Ahmeda. For those tuning in with us for the first time, the Women in Data Science is a worldwide initiative that was launched initially as a one-day conference at Stanford University in 2015 to build a global community for data science enthusiasts from all sectors. The WITS community has since grown this year, with regional events are taking place at over 600 locations worldwide from about 150 in previous years. Today's workshop will feature three distinguished keynote speakers from prestigious academic institutes in the United States and Saudi Arabia. We have uh, guests from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, uh, George Washington University, and King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals. In addition to our guest speakers from industry sectors that are leading the AI and data science innovation, both in Saudi Arabia and the United States, uh, we have Neon, Saudi Aramco, and PayPal. We have for you today three sessions after this opening one. Each of them will give a perspective from both academia and industry on data science and AI applications that are pertinent to the kingdom's current AI initiatives. The themes of our sessions are AI and machine learning for strategic design, data science for simulations in the oil industry, and natural language processing. I'd like to conclude with welcoming you once again, welcome to the speakers, and please stay tuned. Hello everyone, welcome to the Women in Data Science at KFUPM 2021. I'm Dr. Imam Badalila, and I will be chairing the sessions for today's workshop. We will commence our first session with Professor Shuba Vazudiban. Professor Shuba Vazudiban is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and an affiliate in computer science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research interests span reliability of systems and machine learning algorithms. She has won several best paper awards, including one at BAC 2014, one at VLSI Design 2014, and several best paper nominations. Her other honors include the NSF Career Award, AS, AS, ACM CDA uh, Outstanding New Faculty Award, IEEE CEDA Early Career Award, IBM Faculty Award, Dean's Award for Research Excellence uh, in, in UIUC, and the uh, uh, YWCA UIUC Award for Service to Women in Engineering. Goldmine, a verification software for her group, has been developed into a commercial product since 2014 and has been licensed by multiple semiconductor and electronic design automation companies from UIUC. She conceptualized MyTry, a professional networking portal for women engineers in UIUC, she is a technical consultant for several companies. She enjoys mentoring young women engineers and scientists and young women who can be future engineers and scientists. Please join us in welcoming Professor Shuba. And we are thrilled to have you here with us today. And we are looking forward to your talk on data science and system design, experience, value, and some wisdom. Professor Shuba, the floor is okay. yours. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we can. Okay, excellent. So, uh, and you can see me, hopefully. All right. So, um, give me a second while I share my slides. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, we are to give the talk. Yes, please take your time. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me here. This is, seems like a really um, interesting and uh, novel uh, forum even for me uh, to share uh, some of the work that we have been doing in my research group. Um, 
So today I'm going to talk to you more about uh, the kind of uh, data science related uh, research that has been going on in the fields of electronic design automation, which is my primary field of research. Uh, okay, so can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Okay. So um, I have been spending some time uh, in uh, Google AI research and some of what uh, hopefully I will uh, skim over in this talk will be my uh, the lessons that I have learned uh, with applying data science to different aspects of electronic design automation, both uh, as a university uh, researcher uh, as well as uh, in in uh, within Google Brain, so um, I'm going to start by telling you about a problem that I have uh, spent some time of, uh, in my career thinking about, uh, and this is the problem of uh, verific design verification. Uh, design verification is uh, basically checking if a design uh, implementation satisfies uh, some kind of a specification uh, which is written by uh, by computer architects. And this could be in uh, C, C++, it could be in English language documents, etc. And there's a lot of ways and this different art artifacts that you can use to, to check if your implementation satisfies your uh, specification. And that is the question of uh, verifying uh, hardware designs. Uh, at, at, uh, at the outset, if you think about who needs uh, verification, it's literally uh, everybody, whether it's a self-driving car or whether it's a phone or a hardware or any hardware or software system, uh, everybody needs to uh, fit, need, needs to check if the system is actually working as uh, intended before, uh, before uh, uh, letting it out into production. So this is something that uh, is a universal uh, system level problem. And if somebody is building a uh, system, then most likely they need to check it or test it or verify it. So this is kind of a core technology in every single uh, system development process. So, uh, so I want to talk today about how <clears throat> such a core technology can benefit from uh, ideas in data science and ideas in uh, machine learning, which is, which I view as a, a principled way to uh, apply statistics. So um, uh, th this is probably uh, different from the other talks that you're going to see today, because this is kind of a domain of uh, applying it to a process within uh, system development to enhance the productivity of that process is something that uh, is relatively novel, at least in the areas of, uh, uh, in, in, of research within design automation like verification. So a little bit about this, this kind of problem. Please keep in mind that this is not the only problem that we apply data science to uh, in electronic design automation. We apply this to a large number of different aspects of the hardware system design cycle, but this is probably uh, what I thought would be easier as an illustrative uh, part of the design process where, we, where, uh, where data science can help and where statistical analysis can help. So uh, the problem uh, of verification is considered one of the most, uh, is considered a grand challenge of computer science, and it's considered one of the hardest problems in the system design cycle for whether it's hardware, software, or embedded systems, this is uniformly true. Um, and the reason uh, why that is, is because uh, if a 300 flip-flop flip -flop design uh, has, every flip-flop has two states. So a 300 flip-flop design, yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but would you mind, please, if you get closer to the mic? Oh, okay. The voice is not very uh, clear. Okay. Can you hear me Thank better you. now? Yes. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, no problem. So, um, so if a if a single flip flop has two states, then a uh, three hundred flip flop design has more state than the number of protons in the universe. So that's the amount of state that we have to get through in order to say that this system is functioning correctly. And we need to do this. Keep in mind that we need to do this for every system that we are building, and 
the and we build systems with many billions of flip flops so kind of this is just to give you the idea of the scale of this problem so the kind of complexity that this uh, problem has is is uh, much more than the complexity that uh, that we have seen in uh, that that our computers even are able to handle so uh, that's how hard it is so in some sense this is a this is a problem that was hard to begin with and on top of that we keep on uh, manufacturing we, we keep on thinking of systems with all these very cool features right uh, if it's a hardware system then we think about sleek form factor we think about low power low battery we uh, you know things that uh, i mean uh, i'm sorry uh, high 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 battery life low power sleek form factor small area all these uh, very cool uh, things that we think up cool features that we think up for our uh, technologies uh, there is a trade off right and uh, if you if you say that uh, there is no free lunch uh, well uh, the price of the lunch is being paid by uh, these kinds of back end technologies especially the checking of whether that system is working correctly or not so in a sense we have always built systems that we do not know how to check because verification is always an afterthought uh, but at the end of the day the price of the lunch is paid by that verification because that's where so the so an average design team is uh, one third the size of the verification team and it takes three times the number of three times the time and three times the time of the, the resources to verify something as it takes to design that thing and this is true whether you are microsoft or google or uh, whether you are intel or amd so uh, so this is kind of a universal problem and that's why there is some uh, uh, that there's uh, there's some value in in thinking and talking about it so for a problem uh, of this nature what kind of questions do people tend to ask well uh, they tend to ask questions about, uh, you know, do I, how do I scale a tool that can, you know, how do I write a tool that can go and scale billions of state? Uh, the the question, and then they ask questions like, how good are my tests? Am I testing what matters in this very, very large, like beyond human comprehension, large system? How do I know when I'm done? How do I know what to check for? Because I, I definitely cannot go about checking everything. So what do I check for? And given that I'm checking only some part of it, uh, it and given that it's all best effort how do i know that i'm done and have i simulated the hard to detect uh, parts of the design and once i i found a bug how do i diagnose across thousands and thousands of simulations things like this so this whole thing whatever i have the kind of questions i have written here these are this is what forms the billion dollar uh, industries of uh, you know semiconductor uh, chip design or hardware design or uh, not 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 even um, not not even just a chip design system on a chip design and much beyond data center design anything that requires hardware uh, to be designed needs these kinds of uh, analyses and this is the core backend technology that that uh, goes into that goes into those industries so the question is um, so uh, in my research group we have uh, uh, tried to answer many of these questions to a, a large extent uh, and in uh, in doing all these almost every one of our solutions has used uh, either uh, statistical analysis or uh, so either machine learning through statistical analysis of the data or or deep machine learning by building uh, neural network based models for different kinds of data so uh, in a sense this is let me take you through um, uh, a little bit of uh, context and history here as to why machine learning or data is not very natural or has is not very traditional to this problem so uh, in traditionally if you look at this uh, uh, yeah if you look at this uh, uh, figure here uh, traditionally what the way that we have used uh, analysis for all uh, for, for all kinds of design automation uh, processes. So whether it is uh, whether it is floor planning, whether it is uh, uh, verification, whether it's synthesis or logic synthesis or you know, transistor level synthesis, static timing analysis, 
uh, all of those uh, any uh, you know layout any of those different aspects of chip design uh, have traditionally used what you call static analysis so static analysis is you can think of it as the graphs that i've drawn over here as in uh, as a way to wrap our head around what that means so static analysis is essentially using a model and using the analysis from you and trying to a model of the design or the model of that system of the hardware and trying to anal use that model itself uh, in order to analyze so you analyze different like if it's a um, if it's a high level hardware then you analyze and then you draw a control flow graph or a behavioral graph for it if it's a low level netlist you draw so you draw a gate level netlist for it these are models and you analyze their you analyze the model and if it's not hardware if it's software then the same thing applies you can draw uh, you can you can you can somehow uh, come up with a representation of what that system is actually doing the semantics of that system in uh, terms of a model and you use this model as a way to analyze that system this unfortunately has not been very scalable because of the size of this massive size of designs and massive size of programs and everything that we build is much much beyond what we actually know to analyze and so this has so what is on the uh, what, what's shown here with the static analysis uh, has ended up being not scalable and as a result there's only some parts of it that can actually uh, scale to the entire i mean that can actually scale in real systems on the other end uh, you know what what uh, people typically do is run tons and tons of simulations trying to because it's not possible to, to create a model and analyze the system you just run tons and tons of simulations so you, in some sense you're translating a problem which is in space to a problem which is in time by running as many simulations as you can over uh, you know you're trying to run millions and millions of simulations trying to get as much of the state space as possible in there and between these two so one takes for one one is infinite in space like the static analysis and one is infinite in time because you cannot you keep on running tons of simulations neither of these are are very practical and they're extremely resource hungry so the idea of using any kind of data science or uh, some kind of a, a snapshots or examples of the state space and and trying to learn something from them that is something that uh, that is attractive to this domain uh, because it has never because that's never the way that chips were designed that was never the way that this analysis was done right so uh, so ba back in uh, uh, 2009 uh, we had this uh, so for verification and for a particular problem and verification uh, we had come up with a way to do this uh, to use machine learning to combine both static analysis and data analysis and uh, we used machine learning uh, in a way where the static models were guiding the machine learning models and uh, we called this tool gold mine and it was very popular uh, at the time um, and since so and the and and the, the there is another thing here the reason why there is a picture of the netflix up there is to kind of say that because machine learning by itself is uh, inadequate to do this analysis because if you if you just ran machine learning over tons of simulations as is shown here uh, you would basically end up with a lot of garbage output because there is no because with the lack of feature engineering and not knowing exactly what to consider as important there would be uh, you know, it would be kind of uh, uh, it would learn uh, uh, it, it, it would lack context so you know so we came up with a whole bunch of automatic methods that would take all this beautiful literature in static analysis and would uh, combine it with very strategic focused machine learning and over and iteratively somehow make that machine learning give the feedback and make that machine learning much more uh, focused and this is this this is kind of the theme of a lot of the work that uh, we ended up doing in our uh, research but it started with goldmine where we figured that this was a formula that could all that would work in uh, design automation context and goldmine was very successful uh, 
at its time. But what we learned from there is what uh, I was uh, uh, alluding to, which is that we are uh, we treat the simulations itself as data for uh, many of the problems that whether it's root causing or whether it is a diagnosis or whether it is uh, finding it, whether it is generating new tests, we treat the simulations of the of the design as our data. This is not traditionally thought of as data, but this is how, but we can learn, but it turns out that we can learn plenty of things from it. And uh, once we treat that as uh, as data, uh, what we are, we pass it through a machine learning model. Um, sorry, we, we are passing it through a machine learning model. And the machine learning model is basically under, trying to guess the underlying design from the data so instead of so when i so when we we talk about modeling over here we are talking about the design itself so we take the design we take simulations of the design run it through a machine learning model machine learning algorithm and the machine learning algorithm tries to guess the design function so it's trying to approximate and summarize the design function and that's what machine learning is really good at so i'll show you a quick example uh, uh, get, uh, so, so in the interest of time, this is probably the last thing that I'll be talking about. Uh, but it's so uh, if you look here at the way that we decided to employ machine learning uh, for in 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 in, um, in gold mine, what we did was uh, so the problem here was we were trying to generate properties like uh, interesting system properties that we wanted to check. And this is a big problem because people have to actually manually write it and it takes forever and nobody really knows what to write, what properties to check about a very huge hardware system. So it's kind of, uh, it's a, it's a, it tends to be a very time consuming analysis. And so, uh, so the way that we employed data science here was to such, sort of look at uh, a lot of simulation traces uh, from the design. And uh, well, it's not a lot, but it's about like to, to the to the order of between uh, 500 to 1,000 samples uh, of simulation traces. Compare this, you know, where where so usually it takes uh, a lot of samples over a long time, like months and months, to actually converge on the design. But in this case, since we're using a machine learning algorithm, in the next phase we basically did something. Uh, very simple like a uh, like like you know, any so you can substitute this uh, decision tree building with any ma any machine learning algorithm and we found that each of these work in a different interesting way but if you actually for the simplest explanation if you actually build a decision tree from all the simulation traces that you saw for every single output then uh, you end up then you know it, you, you get a whole lot of likely uh, rules that are true about your design and uh, we then pass it through like a formal verification technology and formal verification basically is used for saying whether a property is true on the entire design or not and given that these are guesses that are thrown by the decision tree on or by the ml algorithm on what kinds of uh, traces are true and what are not uh, what kind of properties are true and what are not we run it through a formal checker and that acts as an oracle and that says, oh yeah, these are really true, which basically become your actual assertions or properties. And these are not true because they were only true about the simulation traces, but not about the whole design. So the formal tool then gives a counter example that, then, that we then add to the uh, data, we append to the data uh, that, is, that, that goes inside the uh, decision tree. And so now we build incremental decision trees. So something as as simple uh, and we do this iteratively until we come to the point where the formal verification does not produce a counter example and only generates true assertions so something which is fairly a very a fairly simple loop like this uh, basically what what it ended up doing was notice that in every such iteration what we are generating is uh, with the counter example these simulation traces are can act like a test because each time that we come up with a set of um, we come up with a set of traces, the decision tree, the incremental decision tree at every point is basically learning the new design function, right, incrementally. Uh, and it's and at the time that we've converged and we know that uh, there are no false counter examples, that means that the entire design function that it has learned is absolutely representative of that design, right? And in doing that, if you can see this figure, 
from starting from zero, where we basically gave no simulation traces or completely random simulation traces that had no coverage. So starting from 0% coverage, we basically ended up getting to 100% coverage of the state space within 13 iterations or or less, right? Within, uh, within less than 15 iterations. And what this means is that this, a uh, machine learning algorithm by just by looking at random simulation traces was able to guess the design function uh, completely within a very short number of uh, iterations so this kind of this kind of thing i want to i want to uh, stop with uh, uh, something that uh, i think would uh, would be relevant to this audience so uh, we have by the way we have applied this kind of uh, analysis to almost to various problems so we've applied it to uh, debugging we've applied it to synthesis we've applied it to uh, uh, to, feed, to to post silicon analysis where basically the uh, chip comes back and there is a bug in it how do you figure out that there is a bug in it well uh, because we have we have certain uh, methods to like domain engineer domain specific features and they would capture the buggy behaviors as uh, outliers and this is all purely by using data I just by uh, this is what I'm post silicon validation is black box uh, analysis where you where, where uh, we cannot really look inside the chip but we have developed uh, ways to do to figure out just by looking at input and output what kind of uh, we've, uh, we we have managed to look at the data and learn how uh, output symptoms uh, are, are are correspond to certain kinds of outlier behavior if we are able to do the right kind of feature engineering and and, uh, and the feature engineering is completely automatic and we're able to do that because and it's a generic feature engineering that would uh, that we are that that can work across designs. So there's different ways in which we have used uh, data science technologies uh, and the kind of um, uh, so in in uh, many of the cases we found like in the automatic debugging method we found that we've reduced gone from 100 percent manual effort to 25 percent manual effort uh we, we've used this for reachability analysis which is also something that uh, to figure out whether we can reach a given space or not uh and more recently uh the work that i'm uh, i have been doing i've been trying to apply uh neural network models to actually uh, identify if we are able to cover different points in uh in a design so if you're so this is more concerning with uh, not not just with verification but also with reliability so uh but while when a design is uh, running during uh, in, during its operational lifetime are we able to uh, find if the if like in a data center like in google's data center if the if a design is uh, if if a computer is running and uh, it can we predict that at what point this will fail or uh, when uh, you know can we come up with a model with a good model for when uh, there will be failures during runtime right and uh, for those kinds of things uh, also it's it's possible to build uh, data centric uh, ml models actually these are all models that are uh, based on uh, deep learning and and we have found that deep learning is able to approximate beautifully what is the uh, similarity between different operational points that are uh, during runtime and it will be able to tell you exactly from by looking at uh, previous data of uh, failures it will be able to tell you which kinds of uh, which kinds of scenarios uh, in a data center would be able to uh, it, it can predict which scenarios in a data center would lead to a failure and what which machines would lead to a failure and what interactions between them would lead to a failure and uh, so uh, and and, uh, we, and and this is ongoing research and we are getting very promising results so this is something that i hope to share with you in the future but in in a nutshell i think uh, what i would like to the message that i would like to uh, leave everyone with here is that uh, guiding uh, data so guiding any kind of statistical analysis like ml based algorithms or even simple decision tree algorithms or a deep or a deep neural network model 
uh, with the domain specific design information such that the domain information is 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 uh, got from traditional uh, EDA methods, right? Traditional EDA algorithms, but the interfacing them with machine learning basically helps the machine learning focus and it helps the cover a large part of the state space, which would otherwise not have been possible with, with just static analysis. So these two things uh, combine beautifully and offset each other's disadvantages. Uh, the mode of uh, providing this domain knowledge is different for different uh, problems with actually whether it's verification, whether it's diagnosis, root causing, reliability. In each case, the, the mode of providing the domain knowledge is different. So uh, if you, you could either engineer handcraft, engineer uh, domain relevant features uh, instead of raw features. But in the case of like the deep learning uh, models that I told you, uh, that you could also uh, use representation learning, which means you could represent your entire system in uh, in a way that the deep learning model can learn something from it. But either way, uh, I think there is a huge uh, scope and a huge promise for machine learning and data science to be applied in these kinds of systems domain. So in uh, these, this is coming up as ML for systems in a lot of different areas. And this is a growing area of research. And uh, I encourage everybody who is uh, uh, who is here to go and to think about this as a possible research area for themselves of applying machine learning to traditional systems, hardware, software, compiler, any any of the systems that have used traditional methods, just change it up by using ML, and uh, and and the results are the, the result is that you can get amazing scale uh, in in return. So that's all I have for today. Thank you very much.